The opening line of a podcast is always the hardest one to write. It's a bit like a first date. There's a clock ticking. You're waiting to see whether you're interested. And I'm awkwardly sitting opposite you, trying to pique your curiosity. And in fairness, with a topic like the history of podcasting, it's more like a blind date than anything else. It could go in any direction. Like, podcasting at times does take itself a bit seriously. And the line, history podcaster makes podcast on the history of podcasting, has the whiff of a satire piece on a slow day about us. But when you strip it back, the story of how podcasting emerged is intriguing. Imagine trying to explain podcasting to someone in the 1980s or early 1990s. How would they react if you told them that you sometimes spend hours in the company of a stranger you've never met? What would they say if you told them that you sometimes listen to them when you feel down, that you take their advice on how to feel better, and they might influence your political views? You might go as far as to say that some podcast hosts even feel like a friend. And maybe you admit that on occasion you even financially support a podcast. Now that person in the 1980s or 1990s would probably tell you you're in a cult. Explaining how podcasting emerged, though, is a fascinating journey through the history of our times. An era that has seen phenomenal change. All the things required to listen to a podcast, the internet, smartphones and Wi-Fi, have transformed our world. Because we've experienced these events, because we've lived through it, we often struggle to fully appreciate the depth of this change. But while you might not be a revolutionary, you are definitely living through a revolution. But the history of podcasting is not just the story of technological change. It cuts to the very core of our being. The history of podcasting is wrapped up in dramatic changes of how we perceive ourselves as individuals as much as anything else. So this series is going to be an odyssey through the early days of the internet, technological revolutions, but also looking at how this technology has shaped and changed us as people. Over the next two episodes, you're going to hear from some of your favourite hosts, including Blind Boy and Jennifer Ford and Sam Bungie, who made West Cork. But to begin, we need a starting point. Oh, before we plunge in, let me introduce myself if it's your first time tuning in. My name is Finn DeWire and this is the Irish History Podcast. Now, I think most of us assume podcasting began around the time we first tuned in to an episode, but it's way older than you might expect. Podcasting really took off around 2004, but I think the year 2000 is a good place for us to begin our journey. That was a really interesting time for lots of reasons, and a very different world in more ways than you might imagine. The internet in Ireland in the year 2000 was, for most people, still in its really early days. Looking back at the conversation happening around the internet is almost like someone in the early 1900s talking about the coming of electricity. There was a lot of talk about an internet revolution, but it hadn't yet arrived. It was kind of like an architect had made the plans, but very little work had taken place on the ground. For example, and this one will seem really funny today, but in that year, 2000, Sheila de Valera, a government minister of the time, would talk about the coming of the internet like an Old Testament prophet. A time will come when the information superhighway will pass through all our living rooms. However, this has not yet happened, nor will it happen for a number of years. I look forward to the day when it does happen. The information superhighway. Now that's a blast from the past. In the year 2000, that was one of the words being bandied around a lot by people who didn't really understand what they were talking about. Another similar term thrown into conversation about the internet was World Wide Web. People would use these phrases in an effort to look smart, hoping no one else knew much about the internet either. And the chances were, in the year 2000, lots of people, maybe most people in Ireland at least, didn't know what they were talking about when it came to the net. The vast majority of the population still lived their lives without ever really going online. It's strange to talk to you about this, given this is the history of your life, but you'll probably be surprised about how few people in Ireland were using the internet in the year 2000. Internet access and usage is something the World Bank has tracked for decades, and in the year 2000, 
When they surveyed the Irish population about internet usage, only 18% of people in the Republic of Ireland had been online over the previous three months. And back then, even if you could access the internet, the idea that it would be used for entertainment like modern podcasting would have been pretty incomprehensible. Using the internet was, for most people, just irritating. Broadband didn't exist, and most homes that were connected used something called dial-up, basically an old-fashioned telephone line. Remember this sound? Dial-up connections, if you remember them, were horrendously slow. The speeds were 56 kilobytes per second at best, meaning this podcast would probably have taken you hours to download, maybe even longer. Now, as ancient as this world of the early internet might seem today, it was laying a foundation for a massive change as life was increasingly moving online. 18% of people accessing the internet might seem small today, but it was on a steep upwards curve. That figure had just been 2% only four years earlier in 1996. Furthermore, a lot of online communities and industries were already established. They were there, just the rest of us hadn't arrived yet. In terms of the story of podcasting, the most important community was obviously that of audio creators. Radio is over 100 years old, and there were lots of communities around things like pirate radio and CB two-way radio long before the internet. And these communities, like many others, were starting to move online through the late 90s. Now, someone you're going to hear a lot from over the next two episodes is a man called Brian Green. Brian was around in the early days of podcasting in Ireland, but he grew up immersed in audio creation of one kind or another. He introduces himself by giving you a sense of that pre-internet community he was involved in around radio and audio creation. It was, it goes without saying, one of the key building blocks of podcasting. I've loved radio since about the age of eight or nine, taking them apart, putting them back together, the radios broadcasting on walkie-talkies, then CB radio, then pirate radio when I was 15, and never looked back, just having loads of fun, doing things with transmitters and transmitting to people and communicating and making friends around Dublin and around the world on radio. Now, in the late 1990s, this community of audio creators was already moving online But podcasting, which began to emerge from the year 2000 onwards, was something new and quite specific. It wasn't just radio shows online. While I am going to focus on the shows that emerged and how they revolutionised audio, I don't want to ignore the technical innovations completely. The earliest phase of podcasting took place between the year 2000 and 2004. This is a bit like the prehistory of podcasting, but it was here that many of the key technological developments took place. In earlier drafts of this podcast, I talked you through these and I will admit it was a bit dull and confusing. So I've stripped it down to three or four things that I think are really significant in terms of our story. So on Christmas Day in the year 2000, a guy called Dave Weiner released code that allowed RSS feeds carry audio. So what does this mean? Well, today this development is still central to how podcasting works. RSS feeds are are what essentially distributes shows. And before Christmas Day in the year 2000, these feeds could only distribute things like text. But after Dave Weiner's development, they could now carry audio. But it is worth saying, podcasting didn't immediately start then. The word podcasting wasn't in existence. We'll get there now in a minute. But the following year of 2001 saw another independent development that would prove very significant in the story of podcasting. That was the year Apple released the iPod. Now, the iPod wasn't the first MP3 player by any means, but over the following years, it would become one of the most iconic and dominant. Then, in late 2003, Adam Curry, a very influential figure, worked on a computer program that facilitated the download of audio using RSS feeds to computers and then could transfer them to your iPod. By this point, the key technical developments for podcasting were in place and there was a growing sense that an audio revolution was in the offing. In February 2004, the Guardian journalist Ben Hammersley pondered what this new medium might be called, and he offered three possibilities. Audio blogging, podcasting, or guerrilla media. Now, podcasting, an amalgamation of the words iPod and broadcast, stuck. And this is often considered as the first recorded mentioning 
of the word podcasting. However, predictions of an imminent revolution in audio seem to ignore one major issue. Listening to a podcast was still not very easy. In fact, I would use the word awkward to describe it. Brian Green explains some of the issues people faced when they were trying to download and listen to podcasts. So the easiest way would be that you could listen online. But the whole idea was that you synchronize to a device and you listen on the go. So phones were incapable of really downloading the stuff and there wasn't the capacity on a phone to hold the files you might want to listen to. This is how most people went about it. They have downloaded the audio over a 56k modem overnight, synchronized it to their iPod and put it on when they were on the bus going to college or work. Now, there were too many obstacles and stumbling blocks in this process between podcast creator and potential listener for podcasting to go mainstream in 2004. And while it was clear this wasn't going to become immediately popular, a community of early adopters to podcasting did emerge in Ireland in 2004. For example, the website podcaster.blogsome.com was hosted by an Irish guy, Liam Burke, who still makes podcasts today. In fact, he was actually one of the first people to make a podcast in Ireland. But anyway, I went through the archives of that site to get a sense of the early community. And you could definitely see from the posts that there was a sense of something in the offing. People were hoping there might be financial investment, but it wasn't yet happening. Podcasters were trying and failing to get advertisers. And this inevitably made things hard. Audio is free to listen to, but it ain't free to produce. This is actually crying out for a segue to my Patreon, but I'll spare you. But it's clear from posts in early 2005 that podcasting was really well established in Ireland. Like in January of 2005, a user called Feedback in a Dark Alley posted this, giving a sense of the community in Ireland. A lot of podcast sites have drifted away. I remember back to the beginning of podcasting and looking around Google to find new podcast sites. There wasn't an awful lot of choice out there. Podstar.com was a site which was updated daily with some interesting content that enhanced my experience of podcasting. The idea that someone might be talking about the early days of podcasting in a wistful manner as early as 2005 is revealing as to how old the community is in Ireland. Nevertheless, I don't want to give the impression that everyone was listening to podcasts this early. They weren't. The website Podstar, dedicated to the iPod, described podcasting in 2005 as red hot in the geek universe, but still obscure elsewhere. But there was no question in that year podcasting was in a breakout phase. There was a couple of really significant developments taking place. In 2005, some really big audio producers recognised its potential and were getting involved. The BBC, for example, had already released its radio show In Our Time as a podcast a year earlier, but in 2005 they announced they were going to add a further 20 programmes as podcasts. The Guardian also announced it was going to release a show with Ricky Gervais, Stephen Merchant and Carl Pilkington. Gervais, at this point, was a huge star, having made the comedy The Office, and this podcast quickly gained a massive audience. Major tech companies were also realising the potential of podcasting in 2005. Apple, for example, issued a software update that really streamlined the download and listening process. This was when they started to push podcasting in a big way. So basically what they did is they incorporated a podcast directory into iTunes. Before this, you would have had to go to a separate external podcast directory, find the show you wanted, download it, then transfer that to iTunes, where it would be synced to your MP3 player. Now, this was being done through just one platform, which really helped open podcasting to new audiences. Brian explains how significant this was. iTunes, which eventually got on board around version 4.9 and allowed people to synchronize podcasts to their iPhone legitimately using the iTunes app, which was dominant. It was the it was the big thing. And that was a real tipping point technically for the masses of people who had iTunes accounts and iPods and were using iTunes with other devices other than iPods to be able to easily synchronize their podcasts. And that's how people did it. They would bring it to their phone, pre-smartphone or to their music player and and play it that way. So in 2005, there was a real sense of energy around podcasting. Sorry, that gives the impression I was there. 
Just to be clear, I had never heard of a podcast at this time, but you can definitely see it if you look back, even from the present. Like in 2005, the US edition of the Oxford English Dictionary even announced podcast was going to be its word of the year. And their announcement of this captured where it was at the time. Only a year ago, podcasting was an arcane activity, the domain of a few techies and self-admitted geeks. Now you can hear everything from NASCAR coverage to NPR's All Things Considered in downloadable audio files called podcasts. Thousands of podcasts are available at the iTunes Music Store and websites such as iPodder.com and Podcast.net track thousands more. That's why the editors of the New Oxford American Dictionary have selected Podcast as the word of the year for 2005. Through 2006, podcasting went from strength to strength. Ricky Gervais' show published by The Guardian was claiming over a quarter of a million downloads per month at this point. 2006 also saw WBEZ Chicago Public Radio release their popular show This American Life as a podcast. This, as I'm sure you're aware, has become one of the most popular shows of all time. However, a lot of the shows I've talked about so far, things like This American Life or the large stable of BBC shows being released as podcasts, are not really podcasts as we understand them today. They were content designed purely for radio and then repurposed as podcasts. There were people, though, back then, making podcasts as we understand them. They were purely designed to be broadcast on the internet. Some of those creators were big names, but others had listeners maybe in the hundreds. Brian Green gives a sense of the community in its early phase from about 2004 to 2007. So there's kind of a pre-2004, which isn't really exciting because not a lot is really happening. There's a 2004 to 2006, 2007, which is the real spark and ignite of podcasting that's happening with the technical creators who originated podcasting. Adam Curry, who worked with Dave Weiner on the first programme that could syndicate podcasts down onto your iPhone. His daily source code podcast was really popular with the techies who were interested in the platform and the technology that made podcasting work. And many of the podcasts were technical or sciencey, but all types started to happen in that kind of 2004 to 2006, 2007. Brian mentioned a few shows that were being produced in Ireland back at this point. So the types of podcasts that exist, I've pulled a list of what was around at the time, let's say 2006, and The Spud Show was one of the earliest ones. There was the Two Irish Geeks and a TV podcast, Culture Sluts podcast. LPT podcast. Don't remember what that was. Letter to America. That was a big one. I think it was coming out of Northern Ireland by an American guy. The travel log of an Irish man in Spain. Scouting Radio had a podcast. Well, they were a streaming radio station worldwide, but they had a podcast out of Dublin. These shows, along with thousands of others in Ireland and around the world, were pioneering a new kind of audio that was different to radio. Something that defines podcasting as we know it today. Now, describing this is a bit tricky. It's a bit like trying to describe a colour without referencing another colour. In making this series, I spoke to Blind Boy, who makes one of the most popular Irish podcasts. One of the things we talked about was the difference between a podcast and a radio show. How we listen to podcasts is a very private thing. Listening to the radio is something you do with a lot of people. It's quite rare that you kind of throw on a podcast for a load of people at once, depending on the type of podcast. My podcast is a kind of an intimate relationship with one listener and they listen to that with their headphones on. I asked Brian Green for his thoughts on this, given he's worked in both podcasting and radio. Yes, there is a difference. I I think that when the BBC take their weeks of podcasts or podcasts they made this week and put them out at 11pm and midnight on a Saturday because they're just filling in some time before the one o'clock show. They don't work on radio because they're made for a different audience. Radio traditionally has been made for reception by a speaker. It might be in a car, it might be in a kitchen, it might be in a hotel lobby, it might be in a workplace. And radio could be heard by many. Now, the best of broadcasters said you're talking to one listener to kind of get inside their mind. But podcasting was made for people with headphones on and they were on their own. 
definitely were alone. And the familiarity that the presenter of a podcast will have with their listener, the off the cuff nature of the the way they present and the way that they don't have a particular length to the program and there's no editing and it might be delivered rough and raw from the heart, a monologue or an interview that's not cut up and swear words aren't taken out and there are no Comreg or Ofcom or FCC rules. Podcasting is a different animal and when you put it back on radio, it doesn't sound right. And then going the other way, if you take radio stuff and put it in as Listen Again archive material and call it a podcast, it's not really a podcast. The journalist Rachel Arroesti, writing in The Guardian, captured this when she described podcasting as being intimate as opposed to radio, which can be edgy. Blind Boy got this across really well when he gave me a take of what his show might sound like if it was broadcast on radio. I couldn't present a podcast like this. Here you go, guys. It's the Blind Boy Podcast. How are you getting on? I'm going to speak this week now. I'm going to talk all week. I'm going to talk about the inside of a carrot cake, guys. 576312, if you want to ring up, we've got crazy traffic on the M50. No one wants to listen to that. And that's what radio is. And radio is that way because of like a tradition that goes back tens of years. And radio has to get your attention. And, and radio dudes talk like that because... That's how they used to talk in early discos or at show band things when they were addressing an entire room. But technology does impact this stuff. I mean, if you listen to how people sang in the 1920s, so you listen to pop music from the 1920s and the person is singing like, uh, oh, my darling, oh, my Susie, like this. And it's real nasally and high up. That's because the microphones were shit. And they had to boom their voice in a nasal way or they wouldn't get picked up. And then the 1940s came along and condenser mics got invented, which is what I'm speaking through right now. And then you get Frank Sinatra. Then you get singers who are low whispering intimately into the microphone because the technology allowed it. This casual, more intimate style was pioneered back in this first phase of podcasting as early as 2005 and 2006. Brian Green sent me a show he was making back then. It was called RadioExtasy.net. It had a neat intro as you're about to hear, but you can hear something pretty distinctive, a more casual style we associate with podcasts today when the show proper begins and Brian introduces his guest, Stano. It almost feels like you've just walked into the room where they're recording. We are living a way beyond our moon. In Ballymun and Beijing. Radio WXTC.net. In Kulak and Cairo. Radio WXTC.net. In Artane and Amsterdam. Radio WXTC.net. I'm here in East Wall speaking with Stano, and Stano's just released a collective, uh, respective album called Reverse Presence of his previous works. Hello, Stano. Hello. Listening to that is a bit like handling an ancient artefact, a podcast from Ireland that's about 16 or 17 years old. So while creators were crafting something different to radio, this wasn't the only DIY aspect to podcasting as it was emerging. Many creators were learning on the go. Another host I spoke to was Sinead, who makes the Irish true crime show Men's Rea, and she explained what this could be like. She started making her podcast around 2017, but I think the point holds true for the earlier phase as well. I just went and I like ordered a mic and bought a website and started. I had no idea what I was doing. But yeah, I just I just did it. I had no idea how to record or I had to had to learn all of that from scratch. I'd never used any kind of audio recording. I'd never done any audio editing. I'd ne- never done any of it. I hadn't even used Twitter. Like I had to set up everything <laughs> to begin with. <laughs> so um, yeah, I learned everything from the beginning and I'm still learning. Now, despite all the difficulties the early podcast hosts faced from technological barriers to people listening in the absence of smartphones all the way through to the challenges of creating a podcast, they could enjoy pretty decent success Back then, this was partly because podcasting was niche and subcultural, and this actually nurtured independent creators in an early phase that lasted from about 2004 to 2006. Brian explains the dynamic that was at play. 
Like any technology, the early adopters have a huge share of all audience because there's very few of them. It's like websites in 1994. If you had a website, you had a lot of traffic, relatively speaking, to the amount of people who had modems in their computers. And the same would be through about 2004 to 2008, 2009, because we're pre-iPhone and we're pre-smartphone, really. And yeah, it, it, the numbers are small, but the share that any podcaster had of all listeners would have been high, which would have kept them interested in being there. I will say this wasn't just limited to the early phase of podcasting. When I started this show in 2010, I benefited from a similar dynamic simply because there was no other independent Irish history podcast being made at the time when Sinead, the host of Men's Rea, who you heard from, started her show. She similarly benefited from the fact that there was no other Irish true crime podcast at the time. You know, you stick in Ireland and crime or Irish crime and I would pop up and there wouldn't be very many other people popping up <laughs> when you when you put that in the search bar at the time. So that kind of increased the numbers. We are starting to get a little bit off topic, but I would doubt this is true for any genre of podcasting today. I'd say you'd be pretty hard pressed to find any topic that doesn't have a podcast about it in 2023. But I want to keep focus and not wander into what is essentially the second age of podcasting. That's for next week. Let's get back to the origin story as such. So far, we've seen how podcasting emerged from 2004 to 2006. And 2007 seemed to offer even greater potential. That year saw the arrival of the smartphone. Prior to these, mobile phones had been really basic. They had very limited storage and most couldn't really connect to the internet. They used this thing called WAP. Do you remember that? It stood for Wireless Application Protocol. I never knew anyone who used that and it was just really expensive. But smartphones were clearly going to revolutionize all this because they could connect to the internet in a functional way. But it was going to take a few years before they spread through the population. Now at this point, you might be wondering, why did it take podcasting so long to become really well established? It was really a decade after this early phase that most people started listening. But it was at this point, just as the smartphone was coming down the line, that many of the independent creators were facing major challenges. They were starting to see major competition for what was still limited audiences because, I guess, they were kind of victims of their own success. While these creators had helped to make podcasting more appealing and more viable, this started to draw in more and more traditional media companies who just repackaged radio shows and began releasing them as podcasts. This began to drive out the independent podcasters in what Brian describes as the pod fade of the early 2000s. The pod fade of that first wave of people would have been when the radio stations started to dominate the charts and they weren't as popular as they used to be a year and a half, two years previous. Then the kind of next phase is a dormant phase, really, where the radio networks were dominating the charts for about six years to 2012, 2013. And the independents were shoved out a bit in terms of size. I could definitely see how small indie creators would have felt the squeeze as big media corporations started to take their audience. It must have been really disheartening. Don't forget, there was no Patreon that would help sustain creators back then. And around this time, another factor came into play. That's the 2008 recession. That hit podcasting really hard. In recessions, advertisers retreat into safety and trying to convince them that they should go with podcasting, a new, novel form of media, was very difficult. So the major financial investment people had hoped would come clearly wasn't in that climate. By 2009, podcasting was in something of a wilderness. It didn't stop or anything like that. It just wasn't the in thing anymore. The term Brian used, fade, is a good description for what was happening. It doesn't mean... As I say, podcasting disappeared. Lots of us, maybe yourself included, started listening to shows back then. But there's no question, in general, podcasting was being discussed less. Anecdotally, I remember when I started this show in 2010, a really common conversation you'd have with people was, what's a podcast? Now, a really fair question you might have at this point is how did podcasting get from 2009, say, where it seemed to be in decline, to the 2020s, where pretty much everyone seems to be making a podcast? 
That's going to be the focus of next week's show. But before I let you go, I want to circle back and put a pin in a few things that were happening in wider society that I think were really significant in terms of the success of podcasting when it would bounce back around 2013 to 2014. In the early 2000s, entertainment in general was trending away from collective experiences towards more individualistic ones. Now you might wonder what I mean by this and what the hell it has to do with podcasting, but you have to bear with me here. So this trend began decades earlier, in the early 20th century. In the past, traditional forms of entertainment tended to be more communal, more collective, like things like sport or storytelling on a dark evening. As I say, these were intensely collective and people often just gathered for each other's company as much as everything else. The emergence of television in the later 20th century certainly undermined this. By the 1980s and 1990s, it was one of the most common forms of entertainment and it was very different to the collective experiences of the past. People now gathered with their family or flatmates and watched television, but it wasn't really a collective experience. It wasn't very interactive. You just watched what was happening on the screen. It's a very much a one-way style of communication. Now, while television was making entertainment more individualistic, it also was having impacts in other ways as well. Soccer is a good example, and stay with me for this, because I think it is a pretty significant example. So through the early 2000s, more soccer matches than ever were being streamed on television. While stadiums remained packed out for higher profile games, broadcasting these games began to erode the collective experience of people who attended football in lower leagues. A study in Strathclyde University, which analysed the 2002 to 2003 soccer season in Scotland, revealed that when a game was available to watch on television, attendances fell by 30%. What matters to us, though, is that this was just another example of an intensely collective experience, that of attending a soccer game, was being replaced by a more solitary, individualistic one, that of watching the game on TV. Society as a whole was becoming more atomized. And I think this helped prepare the ground for podcasting, which, as you know, is intensely individualistic. If you're listening to this with somebody else, I would imagine it's pretty unusual. Now, I'm going to return to this next week, but for the time being, I just want to flag that this process of collective entertainment being pushed aside for more individualistic ones was very advanced by the early 2000s. Then finally, there is also one other event that happened in the year 2000 that we'll discuss a lot more next week. It would be over a decade before it had an impact on podcasting, but in February 2000, an American man, Adnan Saeed, was sentenced to life in prison plus 30 years for the murder of a woman called Heyman Lee. A podcast series, Serial, which investigated this case over a decade later, would have a huge impact on the world of podcasting in general. But that's a story for next week. It's one of the many parts of the jigsaw that explains just how podcasting has become so popular. Before signing off, I just want to say one thing. This series is not designed to be a who's who of Irish podcasting or international podcasting. Sorry if I didn't include you. It wasn't intentional. It was really hard to edit this down. And lastly, I want to say thanks to Brian Green for his interview and sharing his research on podcasting. Thanks to Sam Bungie and Jennifer Ford, who made West Cork, Blind Boy, Sinead, the host of Men's Rea, DJ Walsh and Owen Tab, the host of the Snugcast. While you didn't hear from all of these people in this episode, they will feature in the coming show and their insights were extremely useful in shaping the series as a whole. Sound was by Kate Dunlee. Additional narrations were from Therese Murray. All that's left to say is my name is Finn DeWire. This has been the Irish History Podcast. Oh, and before I let you go, if you did enjoy the podcast, consider joining the listeners who make the show possible by supporting my work on Patreon. I have links to Patreon and Acast Plus in the show notes below. A small amount from you really makes such a huge difference because when lots of listeners do it, it helps get this show out. Thanks for your time. Until next week, Sloan. 